Welcome and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us to our virtual campus watchers this morning, and of course to everyone sitting in here this morning in our worship center. We are so glad you are here. Is everybody enjoying their Sunday this morning? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now, online campus, we need to hear from you. I want to get some comments. I hope you're enjoying it, too, this morning. And I just got to say welcome to the fifth and the final week of I Love Sundays. Uh, it's here. Yeah, the fifth week is it's here. I Love Sundays. And we've been learning that the pace of our lives and the priorities of our lives, they are should be and they need to be set by our Sundays. And we've been learning that God has made us, in fact, designed us for a day of rest refueling and refocusing by participating in church on Sundays and taking the Sabbath every seven days. Now, during this series, we've looked at why Sundays are so valuable and so important. And we've learned that uh, Sundays can surprise us, right? They can surprise us. And that God intends for Sundays to be the best day of our week. And we've learned that good Sundays make better Mondays. Who wouldn't want a better Monday? And that he created the Sabbath for us. There's a rhythm to life. When we don't get together and recognize the Lord's Day, it just makes the rest of our week off. Just, you know, just off a little bit. Better Sundays make better families. The greatest advantage we can give our children is life, or is to give them life that is trusting God, that they trust him, and that they know him and his son Jesus and have a relationship, right? And a big part of that is gathering our families together with fellow Christians on Sundays. And then Sundays, they can change eternities. They can change our eternity because God's plan, since man's failure in the garden, since we messed up, has been to restore us to his family. And that's the first four weeks in a nutshell, what we've been talking about. In this fifth week, woo, this morning I want to show you with, with God's leading how Sunday has changed the world. Yeah, there is an enormous amount of good that has been done by the people who call Sunday their Sabbath. And we call those people Sunday people. So you all are Sunday people. All right, just so you know, you're Sunday people. May not be morning people, but you're Sunday people. And uh, it has really, it, they, these Sunday people have changed the world over the last 2,000 plus years. They have. And uh, I, I want to ask you this morning, if you're ready. To open your Bibles or get your handheld Bibles turned on there and get to Matthew 16, 13. Get to Matthew 16, 13. Bookmark it or just get it ready. And while we're doing that, I, I want to uh, make a bold statement this morning. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ, God's Sunday people, have done more good for this world than any other group in history. Any other group in history. Personally, I've always been impressed by people who could look into the future and shape the world in positive ways. I, I really have. You know, even to the, uh, uh, the customer service manager that I, I knew it when I was at the Decatur store, this, that girl was bubbly all the time. Always in a positive mood. Never had a negative thing to say. Work was great. Angry customers, ah, they're just, they, they just got to get it out there, fine. You know, anybody know that type of person? Right? But boy, she can look at life in a positive way. I will say that. I will say that. But there are people who have shaped the world because of their positive outlook in a positive way they looked at things. People like Charlemagne, who decided that every child in, this empire, in his empire should learn to read. So he created the first public education system. William Wilberforce helped mobilize grassroots support to abolish slavery. Wilberforce repeatedly took proposed laws to the British Parliament until eventually the slave trade was banned and slaves were set free. Or Abraham Lincoln, who led the United States through the Civil War and ended the tyranny of slavery here. Over 50 years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. was able to envision a day when people would, would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character and the Civil Rights Movement was born. The ability to imagine a better future and help create it is a gift. And when people use that gift, 
they end up giving a great gift to others. History is rife with such people, but in my humble opinion, the greatest foreseer and shaper of the future was a carpenter from Nazareth named Jesus. No one has given the world a greater gift than Jesus. So let's start reading today, and we're going to look at his, Jesus' exact words at Matthew, in Matthew 16, starting at verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, sorry, he asked his disciples, why do people say, or who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? That's where youth ministers learn that, get to the exact point with these students. We learned it from Jesus. No, 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 I want to know. I don't want to know what all the others think. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered. Leave it to Peter to get the first one in there. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human beings. Can't you see Peter just kind of straighten his robes up? Yeah. yeah. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Woo! This is some powerful little verses right here. Now, imagine if you've been hiding nearby that day behind a bush or a tree and you overheard those words. Wouldn't you have been tempted, just a little bit, tempted to think that Jesus was out of his mind, crazy, maybe delusional? He was speaking to, remember this, 12 adolescent boys. In an out-of-the-way place, in a backwater nation, under the oppressive thumb of the Roman Empire. How could one rabbi with 12 young people, probably all older teenagers, establish the greatest philanthropic organization in the world? And then add to that fact that this rabbi was going to be beaten and die a horrible death at the hands of the Romans just a few months later. The odds were not in his favor. In fact, Las Vegas would have probably laid down the biggest long shot odds in their history if people were betting on this. And yet today, it's true. The church of Jesus has improved our world more than any other entity on earth. Now, how many of you enjoy a movie about an underdog? Who likes a movie about an underdog? Rudy, Karate Kid, Rocky, remember Titans? Any, any, any people like those? I love the movies about it. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. I love the movies of the underdog, right? I mean, cool runnings, you know. Feel the rhythm, feel the rhythm, look at that. Boosh. Anyway, I, I love those movies, seeing them get, you know, win and overcome all the odds. Well, the story of Jesus and his church is my favorite underdog story. Jesus is about to overcome the world and then change it. Change it with both hands. Basically, tied behind his back through his church. Because the world was against Jesus. Was against him. But why? Why has Jesus' church changed the world? Well, first off, primarily because Jesus said, follow me. Jesus said, follow me. Matthew 16, 24, just a little bit farther down in that chapter we were just in, says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Did you catch what Jesus was saying to me? To be a Christian, to be a part of his church, we have to follow him, follow Jesus, but not on our own terms, on his terms. You can't get up there and say, Jesus, I accept you. Good, let's go this way. No, no, I accept you, but I'm going this way. That's not following. That's what he's asked us to do here. That's what he's asked his disciples to do here. If you look through the four Gospels, you will find 13 times when Jesus makes that two-word request of his disciples. Follow me. Follow me. 
as Hal Seed says in the book, I Love Sundays, that's our book we're reading, about the phrase, follow me. He says, Jesus was asking his followers to imitate his values and actions. Follow me meant do as I do, think as I think, love people the way I love them. Woo, wait a minute, Jesus, I'm all on board, but you talk to some people I don't want to talk to. And you've gone places I'm not sure I want to go. And the way you think is that's new, that's cutting edge. Um, I need to learn a little more about this before I... You see, that's what the disciples had in their mind. And that's what some followers, quote-unquote, of Jesus today think. And that's not it. He says, follow me. And when he means follow me, in other words, he means love all, care for others. Love all. Woo, that's a tough one. Care for others, putting others first. When you read the conclusion of, of the book, I Love Sundays this week, you will be reminded that as the disciples proclaimed the gospel, they followed Jesus' example and loved on all people and cared and looked out for others. How? See, the author further reminds us that those original disciples followed Jesus to Greece, Turkey, Spain, Italy, India, Africa, and parts in between. Within a century, Christianity had spread throughout the Mediterranean basin. Wherever they went, they loved people so authentically that their faith was contagious. Man. And he goes on to say, new religions were illegal in the Roman Empire, so Christians, they were persecuted. Sometimes their belongings were seized. Other times their bodies were burned or fed to lions or used as gladiator fodder in the Roman circus they called the Colosseum. And instead of scaring people from Christianity, these heroic acts where people stayed true to Jesus drew people to the church. No one could argue about their sincerity, the sincerity of Christians' beliefs. So the movement grew. The movement grew. You see, Jesus taught his followers to love their neighbors as themselves. So in Acts 2, and this is during the first few weeks after the church was really born, really going, just to get started. The Bible says, verse 44 of Acts 2, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, shared their money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Saved. They just weren't adding people who just came along and wanted a meal. Those who were being saved. Now, if some of you read this today and say, you know what? I'm going to sell my car. I'm going to get, man, God has inspired me. I'm going to sell my car. All right, well, have a plan to get to work on Monday morning. If you need a ride, I'll help you out for a few days. But have a plan. Let God lead you, okay? It's fine. I mean, God might be leading you to that. I'm not going to slow you down. He might be leading you to sell your home. And we have rooms in this church you can sleep in. That's fine. But understand, we have no showers. But pray. Ask God to lead you today and how this verse applies to us. There may be something he's asking you to give up to help someone else. And that is so, so awesome that you would follow through and do it. And that's what we're asked to do. But let him lead. Let him lead. Jesus also taught his followers to care for the hungry. So in Acts 4, the early church again, the Bible says, 434. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give those in need. Acts 4, 34 and 35. Giving. Everything extra we have. Give it all. It's God's money in the first place. So what you have, give to others. Again, I'm not asking you to give up today's Sunday meal so that you don't eat. That's not what I'm saying. But what Jesus is telling us is, if we'd all together, work together, give what we have together, 
we can care for those around us. We can care for those around us. And I want to take this moment to say, thank you, church. Thank you, church. Times, times are getting tough out there, right? I mean, it's getting tough out there. When you've got to take a loan just to get here on Sunday mornings, it's getting tough. <laughs> right? But you all have continued to give so that the church can use those funds to give benevolence but to give benevolence to people. We have helped families that you, you won't know about because it's, it, it's been kept anonymous, but they needed help. And because of your giving, we've been able to say, sure. We continue to give to our outreach, all the outreach stuff you see on the board out there, all the Shiloh Christian Children's Ranch, Little Galilee, LC, all these places we help at. We've continued to be able to give because you have given so generously. So I say, thank you. Thank you for letting the Lord lead you to do so and letting the Lord then using those funds to help others. Thank you. You know, you look at those two verses of the early church. Man, wow. It is no wonder so many people were attracted to these Sunday people, is it? I mean, aren't you inspired when you read this stuff? The early church inspires me in so many ways. Just, uh, I want to ask and think about this, pray about this. What do we need to change or continue to do as a church to attract people, not just to the building, to MCC, but more importantly, to Jesus, to show them Jesus? Is there something else we need to be doing or something else that we're doing that we need to do a better job of or continue to do? I'm sure you guys have ideas. I'm sure God is talking to you. Let us know. We want to work together to make God's vision, God's plan for MCC happen. Jesus' Sunday people, it just spread to other parts of the world as well. From Israel to Syria. They started a church in Antioch. Listen to this description of what Antioch was like before Christianity arrived. This is from Rodney Stark, the author of The Rise uh, of Christianity. It said, a city filled with misery, danger, fear, despair, and hatred. A city where the average family lived a life in filthy and cramped quarters, where at least half of the children died at birth or during infancy, and where most of the children who lived lost at least one parent before they reached maturity. A city filled with hatred and fear rooted in intense ethnic antagonisms. Who's ready to plant a church in that city? They did. Now listen to Stark's description of what happened when Sunday people showed up there. Once Christianity did appear, its superior capacity for meeting those chronic problems soon became evident and played a major role in its ultimate triumph. Jesus, through his church, changed that city changed that city because the people did what they followed what jesus wanted them to do you know that type of story has repeated itself year after year in every country and place where jesus's people the sunday people dwell here's an example in ad 260 the entire roman empire was hit with a plague that killed somewhere between one third and one half his the, the people stark writes so think the pa think, think pan pandemic, but think bigger, harder. Uh, Dionysius, a bishop at the time, wrote, At the first onset of that disease, the pagans pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert that spread and contagion of the fatal disease. That was their only answer. Oh, you got it. Get out of the house. Get out on the road and die. We're not going to touch the corpse. We're not going to give a proper burial. We're not going to take care of the dead. But meanwhile, the followers of Jesus nursed the sick and dying and even spared nothing, spared nothing in preparing the dead for proper burial. The church did that. Not the government, not any other organization. The church in A.D. 362, Emperor Julian lamented that he and his pagan friends needed to 
imitate the virtues of the Christians. He said, for their benevolence towards strangers and care for the graves of the dead, the, Im 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 the impious Galileans support not only their poor, but ours as well. What? These Christians are supporting everybody? This is not right. Julian was bothered that so many people were converting to Christianity because of the loving actions of Christians. He launched a campaign to create pagan charities in an effort to match the Sunday people. He tried. Created a, an organization without Jesus. And you know what? They failed. They failed. And the church did what? Kept going. Kept going. Today, there is a small metal door painted white on the side of a tiny mission church. I think that will be the next slide she shows. In, uh, um, in Johannesburg, South Africa. The door... The door is transforming lives. On it are painted the words, Door of Hope. That is exactly what it is for the various babies within the city. On average, and this has actually gone up a little bit since I read it. I just read a new statistic today. But anyway, on average, there's some 40 to 50 babies that were being abandoned before this door showed up on the streets to die of exposure or starvation every month. Every month. Then the mission installed that door, which is a baby bin, allowing mothers to anonymously deposit their unwanted babies and have someone love them and care for them. Now, that mission church is saving over, well, it's well over this now, 100 babies a year. What a church. What an incredible door. Jesus used a simple thought. Someone created the door because he gave them a simple thought. Making a difference in the community. You see, those stories, that church, that mission, that's what Jesus had in mind when he stood in Caesarea Philippi and announced, I will build my church. In his mind, Jesus saw his people reaching out with love and kindness to help others. Jesus' vision, Jesus' vision was that his people would gather on Sundays to rest, be refreshed, refocus, and then scatter on the weekdays to take his love to their neighborhoods and their communities. Just like our sign says as we're leaving. Right? We're now leaving to head out to where? Our mission field. Right? We're going to our mission field. I love Sundays in part because Sundays inspire and motivate people who celebrate them. And in those people inspire and influence the world with God's truth and with his love. I get so inspired when one of you tells me a story about how God did something, and then you said, ooh, and you follow along with it, and then God does something with that. It is so amazing to see our church work the way God says it will if we follow him. Ah, that is just part of the story of the church and why the church changed the world. Now for some of the other reasons why. Now, I didn't put this on your bulletin. This was a miss on my part. But I want you to add this in front of those final three points. I want you to add this, this, this little sentence because it's going to kick off each of those three points. And the sentence, the, the sentence is, because wherever Sunday people go, because wherever Sunday people go, they follow Jesus. The second point, though, is, and God is with them. Because of wherever Sunday people go, God is is with them. There is no greater ally. There is no greater friend. There is no greater companion. There is no greater God. God is with them. Isaiah 41, 13. For I hold you by my right hand, I the Lord your God, and then I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. God of all the universe, the creator the most powerful, all-powerful being is there to help each and every one of you. There is no greater ally, no government, no neighbor, no spouse. There is no greater ally than God himself. Matthew 19, 26, the other verse up there, Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, 
Everything is possible. You know, I see the backpacks fill up here once a month. I get, I get to be here in the morning. Well. Watch the ladies, and they're done, right? One minute they're putting piles on tables, next minute they're leaving. Ah, it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. What is so cool about that is, if you would have told me before we started this project that we were going to feed so many kids here in Muhammad, and it was going to get done right here in this church, logistically I was thinking, peanut butter's great, but that ain't enough to feed these kids. And all these people work together, get all these different snacks and things to go with the peanut butter into these backpacks, into these bags that go in the backpack. Because God is involved. Someone followed his lead, right, and turned it into that. And it gets done because it's not impossible because God says, I want it done. And it gets done. God makes it happen. 2,000 years ago, Jesus announced that nothing was going to stop him from building his church. And nothing has because God has been with his people. His church today, the church of Jesus, is over 2.38 billion strong and growing daily. No greater ally than God. Which leads us to another point about why the world has changed by the church, has been changed by the church. Because wherever Sunday people go, lives change. On Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead. He reunited with his disciples in the upper room. After training them and teaching them for 40 days, he ascended to heaven. Ten, ten days later on Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit came down and Sunday people were born. Sunday became the Lord's Day. As Christians huddled on Sundays, they grew in faith. And then they went out and served down and outers, up and outers, and everyone in between. According to Dr. D. James Kennedy, Sunday people invented the modern hospital. And you can go look. These are facts. The university, university system gave literacy and education to the masses, created free enterprise, representative government, civil liberties. Sunday people were the ones who abolished slavery in England and the United States elevated the status of women, and invented the very concepts of charity and benevolence. Lives changed because of God's church. A majority of people groups on earth today had their languages codified by Christians who created their alphabets, then translated the Bible into their languages. The reason uh, Russia has a, a, a Cyrillic alphabet is because St. Cyril uh, created it for them created a form, a Christian created a form, so they could have the scriptures. The story has been repeated in languages and in countries all over the world. Lives changed. A few minutes ago I said, I've always been impressed by people who could look into the future and shape the world in a positive right way. Most of the people who've done that have been Christians. I mentioned Charlemagne. He was founder of the Holy Roman Empire was mo motivated to create public school education. Not so they knew more math. Because he wanted every person in his realm to be able to read the Bible. William Wilberforce was the most high-profile member of, of a, a sect, a group of Christian campaigners that were centered on the, around the Anglican church in South London. And that's who fought to end slavery in England. Abraham Lincoln, the emancipator of slaves, was a committed Christ follower. Martin Luther King Jr. was a Baptist minister. And because Jesus worked through them and they followed him, they all changed lives. They all changed lives. History confirms that the church of Jesus has affected more positive changes on our world than any other entity. Why? Because it unites and energizes the efforts of Sunday people. How many of you get jazzed and energized from being here? You know, when the kids are up here singing and, and want to lead you in worship, half of them are scared to death. <laughs> but they feel led. They want to use their talents. They see your energy. It excites them. And then you guys get excited about it. That's how 
the church works. That's how the church works. More than any other group, the church has changed the world. And more than every other group together, more than any other group together, the church has outshined them and changed the world more than all of them combined. Guess what? Well, that's great. Yeah, the global you know, Catholic Church has changed the world. The big organization, yeah. MCC has changed lives. MCC has changed lives. The ladies have built mats for the homeless. We don't know them personally, but we've made a difference in their lives. Well, all I do is bring bags. Yeah, but those bags, God does something cool with them with the ladies, and the next thing you know, they're not sleeping on the ground anymore. We have distributed, since COVID began, thousands, and I do mean thousands, of bread loaves and buns and croissants and snack cakes. Right, Bob? Bob's moved all the racks for all these weekends, so he knows. We have thousands and thousands of loaves of bread. We've built, like I said, backpacks and donated peanut butter. We've donated food, money, and time to helping hands. We have built shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child, so kids all over this world got a little something at Christmas. Plus, we got a little bit of Jesus in the process. We have built, uh, or we have helped families at Thanksgiving time to have turkey dinners. We've helped parents give their kids a nice Christmas. We have donated toiletries, hygiene products, and this year we took care of all the angel tree gifts for It Takes a Village, this church. Just the pat this past week, and you hear a little bit more later, we served lunches at Candlewood and fed kids of all ages. Our church. In July, there's a team that's planning to help out at Macy and get them lunch during the week of July for three different days. And that's over 100 kids. I couldn't figure it out, but we have people who can. And we're going to do that. We're going to help. You donated over 180 plus uh, pump soaps and dispensers for Little Galley that are going to get to them this week. That it's going to keep those kids, at least their hands will be clean for dinner. The prayer warriors have prayed for so many people. And we've seen God answer prayers. Amen, Dixie Schoonover? Oh. Oh. But that's just in the last few years. And that doesn't even include the benevolence and outreach money I was talking about earlier that all your offerings have gone towards to help the missions we support and the families around our community. I'm not even done. Finally, we have seen people come to Christ even during COVID, during the lockdown. People came forward to accept Jesus. That baptistry stayed open. And we welcomed them and baptized them. God has used this church, this body of believers, these Sunday people, all of us, to change lives. And we'll continue to do so as long as we stick to the mission statement God has given us, our six E's, our mission statement, evangelizing, educating, equipping, and encouraging people to exemplify Christ and to engage the communities we serve. We are here to evangelize, to tell people about Christ. The church exists to help educate you and others about Christ. We want to give you all the tools you need to make a difference in and around your communities. And we want to encourage you, as well as all the people that aren't in the building today on, on Sundays, we want to encourage you to continue to get through life. And we also want to encourage you to exemplify Christ, show Christ to the world. And we are. We're not just asking, we're demanding you go engage your community. Because that's what Christ wants us to do. That's what Christ wants us to do. That's our six E's, our mission statement. Now you can love Sundays because you come to a church that stands behind that statement. <coughs> the church follows Jesus and God goes with him. Lives are changed and because wherever Sunday people go, the final point, there is hope. <laughs> I love hope. Someone once said, the church is the hope of the world. And they were so right. Jesus working through Sunday people has altered, catch this, the altitude of the world. 
No, we have our heads down, we have our heads up. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold tightly, without wavering, to the hope we affirm. For God, God can be trusted to keep his promise. Folks, we've got to keep our heads up, not down in despair. We've got to keep our heads looking up. We don't have to give up because our world here is changing. No, 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 no. We don't have to get angry and depressed because gas prices have gone where they've gone and everything else has gone up in price. We don't have to get angry and depressed because the violence is on the rise. We can keep our heads up, looking up, and hold on to the joy that is in Christ because he is our hope. Amen. Not a politician. Amen. Right? He is our hope. And we have to keep our heads up. Keep our altitude where it should be. Not focused on down here. Remember this. And I, we've got to believe that promise we just heard in that scripture. And remember, that hope's never going to fade away. It will always outshine anything horrible, terrible, whatever comes our way here in this moment. His hope outshines it all. You know, world history isn't over yet. <laughs> but we've read the book and we know where it's heading. And there is an event, one more event I want to anticipate for people who love Sundays. And then take their Sundays and live it out on their weekdays. I want us to anticipate an upcoming event. For this event, I want to focus on one more passage, and it begins in Matthew 25, verse 14. 25, 14. Jesus was just a few days before he's going to the cross, and he told this parable, which has been called or known as the parable of the talents. And a talent was a huge sum of money. And I'm going to give you a synopsis of this parable, starting with reading the first verse there in 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave one servant five bags of silver, a second servant two bags, and the last one received one bag of silver, one talent. The first two servants, they invested the money. They doubled their bags of silver. They doubled their talents. But the third was a little bit afraid of his master and didn't want to lose the money so he decided to bury the money after a period of time the master returned and the first two servants came to the master and told them that they had taken their bags their talents and they doubled them they doubled them and look at verse 21 this is what he said to both of them the master was full of praise well done my good and faithful servant you have been faithful in handling this small amount so now i will give you many more responsibilities Let's celebrate together. The servant with one bag, you wonder what he was thinking at this point, don't you? He brought it back to his master and said, I knew you were a hard man. I was afraid and went out and buried my bag in the ground. But you get it all back. I didn't lose anything from you. The talent you gave me. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. Wicked, lazy servant. You should have at least put my money on deposit with the banker so when I returned I would have had my, my talent back with at least some interest. The master took the bag, gave it to the one with ten bags, and then he said, verse 29, To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this youth, useless servant into the, dark, into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers and sisters, this is an important lesson. Don't miss this lesson. This is, this is the church. We're supposed to be the ones that take whatever God gives us and make something of it, not bury it in the sand, not bury it in the dirt. He's asking us, I give you this opportunity do something with it. I give you this gift. Do something for my kingdom with it. What do you want me to do with it? Okay, I'll tell you. Follow Jesus and go. He, there's so much potential, potential for great uh, for um, increasing the kingdom just around us. Worldwide, of course, there's all kinds of things that still need to be done. 
But you don't have to go any farther than Muhammad to see there's things that need to get done for Jesus. And we can do that. Folks, when our life is over, there will be an event. A moment when you are united with your master. And you're going to see Jesus face to face. And he will tell you what he thinks of your efforts. I can only imagine what it's going to be like. I, I really, I can't. David knows already. <laughs> he beat me to something else. He always beat me to the Reese's and now he's beat me to that. I can't imagine what that's going to be like. He will tell you what he thinks of the efforts you put towards advancing his kingdom. According to this parable, those who did an outstanding job, who, who did something with what he had given them, will hear, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. And they're going to be given incredible rewards. And, and those who serve themselves and serve their best interests instead of the kings will hear, you wicked, lazy servant. More than anything, more than anything, anything that they could give me here, anything I could earn here, I want to hear, well done, Jeff. Well done. I want to hear it from the bridegroom and Savior Jesus. And I want each of you, I want all of you to hear those words as well. So we let's all follow him, walk with him, let him change lives through us, and live with his hope, the hope. The major focus of this series has been to refuel, refresh, and refocus by building the rhythm of our weeks around our Sundays. That's what we've been talking about. But the outcome of great Sundays should also have an effect on the world we live in. Don't you think? So come to church every week. Every week you can. Come to church. But along with coming to church, be the church. And that is today's takeaway. Be God's church. Not Jeff's church. Not the elder's church. Not fill in your name, it's church. God's church. MCC, we can't be the church the world says we should be, or the church social media suggests we act like. But we must be God's church and do what he said and act the way he wants us to act. We need to take our place in history beside the Sunday people of every generation. We should find someone in need and help them or care for someone who is hurting or volunteer to help in or around our community. We have multiple ways to get involved here at MCC if you didn't know. And if you need or would like some more information about anything I mentioned earlier about some other way that you can help, you can go to our website, you can go to Facebook, you can go to the bulletin or give the office a call this week or pop in. Just pop in. Everybody pops in. Doors. Doors are open. Come on in. But we can help you get involved. We can help you find a way to use your talents if you're not sure. Or if you've got a great idea, a new idea. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. Dominic came out the door last week. Had a conversation about something he felt we could do. I told him, pray on it. I'll pray on it. And we'll see where God takes it. No idea is off the table. Because if God is in it, our greatest ally. It could and probably will happen. I love you all. I really do. I do. Even you, Jim Mulvey. <laughs> Wait on. We were, I was leaving the office coming out here to get the mic'd up and stuff, and I said, Jim, your sermon, all you gotta do is read it. You don't even have to write it. He goes, No, nah, you're doing fine. <laughs> he, I love you all. And I love Sundays. So one last time in this series, please repeat after me. I love Sundays. I love Sundays. One more time. I love Sundays. I love Sundays. Yeah, let us pray.